Hello and welcome to this video talking about some basic recording techniques and setups. Um, whether you are an interviewer for the Religious Studies Project or whether you are uh, training to do audio editing, this uh, video is designed to set up and introduce you to some of the various uh, methods of recording that we can use for recording interviews, many of which we've used over the years. Um, it's important to note that you will probably not use the full range of these techniques. Um, I've used all of these uh, various times over the years and I have my favourites, but uh, in different circumstances you're going to have to use different setups. Often in the field you might arrive with a very nice professional setup only to discover that the room you've been given in, um, the person with the key isn't there when you arrive with your interviewee and so you're forced to use a backup. Um, other times uh, you might, for instance, take an elaborate setup only to discover you can't connect it anywhere to the system in the room. There's lots of, of possibilities. Sometimes you might just be out when the opportunity arrives and you have to improvise with what you have. These different setups all have their advantages and disadvantages um, and I'm going to talk you through some of what they are both in terms of how you can use them and where but also in terms of uh, the kind of audio results that you can expect to get from them. The simplest setup would be something like this which uh, you know a little sort of portable dictaphone. These are often what people will start with. Um, unfortunately they're really not designed for professional audio work. They're designed to be quick to use and small and, and uh, portable. The audio that they produce due to the built-in mics is often going to be very, uh, what we'd say, boxy. It often sounds like, a, like an FM radio because it's all in the middle of the spectrum. There's very little treble, very little bass, almost no bass in some instances, and it's all very much in the middle and often very compressed, um, giving it a sort of almost kind of distorted sound. Um, we can do some things with e EQ to make that sound a bit more natural and uh, you will no doubt come across that. You often find that with recordings done on Skype as well, which we um, will talk about later on. Um, however, the other, op the other issue with these is that because the mic is built into the dictaphone, there's an issue of distance. The closer you are to the microphone, the cleaner the sound is essentially. The louder the voice is compared to the background noise. It's always important to take background noise into account. Um, for instance, when you're recording, um, is there any background noise that you need to be aware of? Are the cars going past as there are here? Um, one to watch out for is air conditioning. Um, this is a house in Scotland, so we don't have any use for air conditioning, but in uh, university buildings, conferences and the like, you'll very often have um, air conditioning in the background. Can you do anything to remove that? If there's more than one room, is there one that doesn't have air conditioning in it, perhaps a smaller office? Um, can you ask the uh, servitors to turn it off um, in that room or, um, or at least try and use closer mics? Um, this also extends to, if, if you do need to record um, out in the field at a moment's notice, please do not record somewhere where there's a lot of background noise. It will get picked up and there are certain things. Other people talking is very hard to mix out because it's in exactly the same frequency range as the people we're trying to, to, um, uh, trying to hear. So it's almost impossible to remove that without losing the person you're interviewing. Uh, by far the worst one is cutlery and glasses in a restaurant or a cafe. If you can avoid recording in a cafe, please do. There's nothing I can do to get rid of those sounds and they cut through everything. It really is difficult to work with. Be also aware that the academics you're likely to be interviewing have very little media training and are therefore not very savvy about microphones. They will often speak much further away from the microphone than you ask them to, sitting back like they're speaking at a seminar or a classroom rather than in a recording studio which we would prefer. So do, if you need to, remind them to sit close or use a, a clip-on mic as I am, which I'll talk about soon. Um, but also be aware of them hitting the table, 
uh, tapping pens, shuffling notes, hitting watches uh, off tables, shuffling jewellery, all of these things get picked up and are very hard to remove, especially when they're done as they're talking. In isolation, it's easy enough to cut one of those out, but when it comes over the top of a sound, that a word that I can't remove, very, very difficult to deal with. So take all steps that you can to remove those things um, from the recording environment. Therefore, we don't have to worry about recording them from the mix later on and we can concentrate on making the sound much better. The next step up from a dictaphone then is something like this uh, Zoom H2 recorder. Um, it's called a portable recorder rather than a dictaphone because the microphones are of much greater quality. This is actually uh, the famous Steve. It's the recorder that Chris and I bought with our initial £100 investment each into the RSP uh, six years ago. And it's still running, it still gives us good results. For the first two or three years, almost all of our recordings were done with this unit. Um, it's got some very nice features. First of all, it runs off batteries. It's highly portable. We can go out just with this in our pocket and then if the opportunity for an interview arises, as long as we record in a quiet space, we're going to get a very broadcastable interview. It has several settings. You can record as I am now, just recording me, or you can record front and back. And very useful, you can record with four mics in a 360 degree, which is great for putting in the middle of the table and recording discussions, as we've done many times. However, the same problem stands with in terms of distance. This is only going to be as good as how close you can get to it. And especially in a round table situation, that's not going to be very close. You can't sit face to face with your interviewer across the table. So you are going to get room in the recording. And I'll cut now to the H2 audio. And you can hear how much more echoey and reverby that is, even in a fairly flat, dead room like this, than the close mic is when I cut back now. So that's the big difference. However, these are excellent for certain circumstances, and you can um, attach uh, external microphones to this um, for a slightly better um, quality results. You can also think about recording onto a phone, especially again with additional microphones. This is what I'm recording with here. This this clip mic here at my neck, um, giving a very close, uh, almost studio sound. Not quite as good as the high quality mics we'll look at later, but not far off it. Recording onto the, onto the phone, obviously this is very portable. This is a single mic, but we can get pairs which plug into a phone. If this would be something that you'd like, again, we can get that for you relatively easily. This gives you a nice portable and uh, uh, close uh, close mic sound, so perhaps uh, slightly better in that respect than the H2. However, be aware of the quality of the recording going in. Often this will be in a reduced format such as MP3, which isn't quite as good as the full WAV that um, is produced by an H2. Um, and also, you may find that you only have a very limited amount of storage on one of these. So if you're recording multiple interviews at a conference, for instance, you would very much be tied to having to offload um, uh, the interview onto the web and then delete it to clear space and so on. You'd have to also be constantly watching to make sure that it was still recording. But nonetheless, a very good um, setup, especially um, as a backup system. The next stage up would be something like this uh, Snowball plug and play mic. It's called a plug and play mic because it goes to a USB connection and simply plugs into your PC and you can record there using whatever software um, you like. Uh, you could use something like Audacity, but you could also use just the basic um, you know, sound recorder that's built into most PCs. Uh, this will give you a reasonable quality. They're especially good for um, kind of round table search circumstances um, working much the same as a, as a Zoom would. Um, they have a couple of problems, however. They do tend to be um, slightly boxy in the same way that the dictaphones were. They're essentially designed to be easy to use for the amateur. They're not really designed for the professional, so the quality of them is not often what, the, uh, what other systems would give us. They are very easy to use, but that's pretty much the point. Um, they also quite often have a tendency 
um, especially this particular uh, snowball model, which is very popular, they may have a, an automatic limiting feature. So when a loud sound goes into them, they basically lower the input volume for 10 seconds or so. This is to protect the um, input on the computer from overloading and distorting. However, in practice, what this means is in the middle of a, a round table recording, somebody gets a little bit uh, enthusiastic, hits the table or accidentally knocks the mic with their pen. Um, then you have a massive cut in volume for 10 seconds of the audio, which the engineer then has to go and um, try and fix by raising the audio. Uh, and this is often very difficult because by doing so you raise the level of the background noise of course but not only that but the clunk on the original loud noise that causes the limiting then has it generally is needing to be included in the in the signal and it can be very hard to match those two sides of the recording up so uh, you know be aware these things have their limitations it also means you have to be carrying a PC, of course, which then needs a power socket um, just to be sure that it's not going to run out in the middle of the recording. Um, and it's another thing for you to monitor. That's not necessarily a problem, but it does mean you're carrying slightly more equipment and uh, may be tied to where you can get a power source. For all these recordings, it is important to make sure that you have a pair of headphones to monitor the signal that's going to... Um, from the microphones into the computer and try and do that in as many places along the signal as you can to identify potential problems. Um, it's also useful to put the headphones on for a little while um, as a sort of sound check to make sure that both microphones are working as they should. Um, but I don't tend to leave it on for the entirety of the recording. Um, as soon as I know it's up and running, then I'll stop. But don't assume that the signal going to tape is the correct one. I've um, made the mistake in the past of looking at the signal on the screen and not checking and discovered that I was recording with the built-in microphone on the computer rather than the fancy audio setup that I just spent 10 minutes getting ready, which had basically uh, wasted an entire interview. Um, so do be uh, aware of that and always check with the headphones. The next stage up, and this is the one I favour, would be um, basically a miniature studio setup. Um, in terms of Chris and I, when we record our, in, our introductions and often for interviews, when we record interviews, um, we will use something like this, a digital uh, DI box, a direct inject or audio, uh, audio interface box um, with a pair of microphones. So this one is set up to connect to the USB on my PC and I record straight into Audacity using this. I can adjust both levels of the microphones independently and because it's a digital signal, uh, it's very clean. Uh, it's very... It's got very uh, true life kind of sound to it. A lot of bass, a lot of treble. It just sounds natural, but very, very clean, very little uh, background noise or audio hum or anything. Um, usually we'd use two microphones, but this year we've invested in this mixing desk, which means that I can tie this to, um, I could have up to five or maybe even eight or nine microphones, um, which will allow me to use this kind of studio quality setup um, in a relatively small package for conferences and so on. Um, especially for recording panels, round tables, instead of using a, a, a 360 degree mic as we've done in the past, I can give everybody a microphone and get studio quality recording. Um, so the stereo would just come out of here and into the two inputs on this box and into the PC as before. Um, we can use different kinds of mics with a setup like this. I've got two actual audio studio audio quality microphones here. This is a passive microphone, an SM58 industry classic designed for recording vocals has a nice uh, warm sound and um, has a it's not very directional um, it doesn't matter how close you are to the microphone uh, too much it'll pick you up pretty uh, neatly and um, we then have this active microphone here which Chris and I used a pair of today um, they need a power source so you couldn't use it with um, something like the uh, the Shure uh, sorry, the Zoom H2, but as long as you've got one of these audio boxes, it's not a problem. But they um, are much more directional, but they give the highest quality possible sound. This is the kind of instrument you would use for recording an instrument like a guitar, for instance, on a, um, a professional audio recording. 
both cases here I've added a pop shield. This is a, a flat one. This is a, a it's more likely a windshield. Um, but they both um, cut out some background noise from wind, people blowing on the microphone, um, and also remove sibilance and plosives from uh, your speech to produce um, a cleaner vocal sound. <clears throat> this is the kind of setup that we would use um, when we're recording our introductions or when we have a, a permanent room at a conference. Uh, so for instance, when we go to the BASR later this year, that's the setup I'll be using. So I hope this has been useful to you. Again, just to underscore the important points are get as close to the microphone as you possibly can, no matter what setup you're using to avoid room sound. Avoid room sound in the first place by removing any noise from the room. Don't record in noisy places. Um, do anything you can to remove uh, the chance of background noise. Take Ask people to take their jewellery off. Tell them to switch their phones off. And importantly, if you can get them to either switch their phone off completely or onto airplane mode, because certain of these kinds of recorders can pick up the signal from, from phones as they seek um, a tower for a connection and you can get this noise on the recording which you won't hear at the time but um, can utterly uh, ruin um, an interview. Um, make sure that you have a backup if you're going to rely on one of the more elaborate systems um, and always monitor what you're doing make sure that the recording equipment that you're using is still recording all the way through um, that can be an issue. And um, I hope that this has been useful for you and, and can help you to um, either edit or record um, better interviews and episodes. Um, if you need advice or um, you need us to get hold of some equipment for you for your recordings, then do get in touch either with editors at religiousstudiesproject.com or uh, david at religiousstudies. Uh, project.com and we'll sort you out with uh, what you need uh, presuming uh, we can afford it but other than that I would just say thanks for watching